see he's here. Oh, thanks, Dr. Hooper, and uh, thank you all for taking time out of your day to make this happen, and then the whole kinesiology department for all the advances we've been having the last few years. It's been tremendous to help our program out. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about strength and conditioning considerations for the collegiate athlete, and I'm going to talk about how that relates to us at JU. It comes through many different perspectives, and I'll cover a lot of different points that the previous speakers covered and how we can relate that information into how we do things at JU. Uh, this is kind of an overview of the things I'm going to cover. I'm not going to read them off word for word, but I'll talk about the roles of a strength coach and our philosophy, how we like to handle our business. And I'm also going to go over some of your time management, scheduling, coaching issues that you have to deal with along the way. And then also I'm going to go over how I put together my programs, you know, in season, off season, how I select my exercises and kind of the purpose behind that. Okay, so my background and some of my influences, uh, I was a, a junior college football player at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, that was a place where they don't have a strength coach. They hardly have a weight room. There's no structured workouts for your team. Uh, one of my buddies got a hold of one of the Purdue off-season programs. So five of us got it together and we did that workout. And those are about the only five people that were able to make it out of that university or that college to a university. Uh, so it's kind of on our own there. I was fortunate leaving Grand Rapids to get a scholarship at Wayne State. When I went there, I went there uh, into kind of a, a rebuilding process of a program. I came in on the last semester strength coach. I remember standing around looking at my teammates wondering, why are we doing the things that we're doing? And I didn't think they were going to help us out. Uh, I, me being a young kid, didn't know much about it, but I was kind of right. And then the next semester, Paul Harker came in who was a graduate assistant at Michigan State and played football there for Coach Manny for many years, he came to Wayne State and kind of turned our whole world upside down. And the way that he brought his energy, his attitude, and, and the way he goes about his business is kind of the reason that I, I do what I do now. He was my major influence to becoming a strength and conditioning professional. And obviously, Coach Manny at Michigan State and his entire staff, I was fortunate when I got done with my undergrad at Wayne State to take an internship uh, at Michigan State and learn from those, uh, those staff members there directly. I worked with basketball, football, and hockey when I was there. And we were in our camp that fall in 2010, and I had an opportunity to go to Marshall. One of their former uh, students took the director of Olympic job. And I always wanted to be a football strength coach, so I was kind of weary uh, going to Olympic sports. But I had to go, and I figured learning about all these other sports could only help me out as a professional as a whole. So when I got there, I took on seven teams, five female teams, and I also found time to work the football along the way. And I got to learn a lot of different perspectives from uh, sports, athletes, coaches, and kind of just rounded out my experience there. My time at Marshall, we did go through seven head strength coaches or director of strength and conditioning in a year and a half. So I was fortunate to see a lot of different philosophies and ways that people get it done. Uh, Joe Midday was a, an assistant at the time when I got hired, who eventually moved up to the head coach and has moved on from Marshall. Uh, he's also a huge influence with how I like to carry myself, how I program, and how I like to get after my athletes. Uh, and also, I learn daily, and I'm influenced daily from my own JU staff members, which we've had a few come and go, but we've been pretty fortunate to retain uh, them most recently. Uh, the role. to help develop their own personal life in many regards other than just strength and conditioning. And you got to be a leader because you're the one in charge every day when they come in and it could be a 6 a.m. workout. you got to lead this group to get the results they're trying to get. Uh, you're also often given the task of disciplinarian as a college strength coach and many coaches already have that impression. Oh, you got in trouble. Go see Coach Bates. Oh, you got in trouble. Go see your strength and conditioning coach. So you got to take on that role even though Sometimes it may be better for the coaches to take on those roles, to send a better message to the athlete. Eventually it might get into just, oh, I've got to go see Coach Bates again, get my stuff done, and it becomes less important to the athlete. Um, you're going to be an assistant for all your teams that you work with. So understand the roles that you can take on. could be unrelated to strength and conditioning, but ultimately you're trying to help the program out in whatever way you can. Uh, you're going to be a nutritional advisor. Many times that's been talked about a lot over here, and I believe that's uh, lacking in, 
in many programs and many uh, many situations. That's one of our huge dilemmas. So try to constantly advise nutrition, and then you got to be a team player within the department. You can't just stay in the weight room all day. You got to actually interact with people on campus. The administrators that you interact with could be the ones that help you move your facility forward. That help you add staff members. So you can't just sit in your own room. You got to go out and affect everyone on campus. And ultimately. You want to make a positive impact on all your athletes. I've been at JU now for six years, so I've gotten to see some of my athletes move on to do star careers, improve themselves professionally, and it's always nice for them to come back and tell me about what they're doing and how they're using what they learned with us in the, fu in the future. Uh, the mission of our strength and conditioning department is going to be obviously to improve athletic performance and reduce injuries. That's pretty standard across the board. Um, we're going to provide programs focused to hit every realm of athleticism. And if there's something that you're doing in your sport all the time, we might look and see what can we do on the other end to round out the overall athleticism of you to help perform your sport. Uh, the mention earlier for cross country. Uh, cross country was one of my teams at Marshall. And they had never been in the weight room before. And all of a sudden, three, four months into our program, they start telling me how they're hitting their personal records. They're doing all this stuff they didn't think they could, and, and a lot of that was based off the new introduction of training we did. So they never had done, a, a for instance, a bent ankle, ankle prehab exercise. One girl came in, Coach, I rolled my ankle so bad at the tournament, but I just kept going. didn't even matter. In the past, I might have been taken out for that. So, so that's just something that we could do to affect somebody. When I first took cross country on, I thought, oh, they're an endurance team. I got to train high reps, and I got to do all this. And it was quickly made to the point that what are they not getting? in their day-to-day -day, and how can I help round out their whole entire athleticism. Now, throughout that though, you have to demand perfect effort and perfect reps. It's got to be 100% effort, 100% focus, and you got to be hitting all the parameters of the particular exercise to make sure that you're going to get the result. And, and, and if you have to back up and wait, if you have to break it into parts to help that athlete understand what the emphasis is and try to get that, then that's what you got to do. It's not just going to be the same thing for everybody. Uh, we're going to do everything uh, with a highly motivated, high energy atmosphere, we're trying to make sure that the kids can feed off each other, putting them in competitive situations. And then it's going to have to be a positive, clean, safe environment because safety is always first. If, if we get a kid hurt in the weight room, can't go and perform their sport, then we're not doing them anything but a disservice. We haven't helped them at all. And also, we have to provide guidance on all the factors that uh, contribute to your athletic development. I'm going to go over these really quick. This is a clip from what goes in our summer packet for our spring signees this year. And we're going to talk about lifestyle, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol, sleep habits, making good decisions is going to be a huge effect on your development. We're all going to do the same amount of work, but the people that can control these factors are going to be the ones that reap the most benefits. Hydration, nutrition is a huge problem amongst our population and really every uh, strength and conditioning coach that I talk to. This is one of the huge factors that we try and try and try to help our athletes out. And you're going to have to keep on trying and trying and trying because they're going to keep falling short. You can hopefully bring them up to an acceptable level. And an effort and consistency, uh, that might be just as, they're really all as important as each other. But an inconsistent athlete is one that's never going to continue to improve. A low effort athlete is one that's never going to continue to improve. And then those athletes can start affecting your ultimate program by everyone around them. Controlling the controllable factors is what I like to say to our kids a lot of the time. Uh, mental toughness is a development factor that can often be overlooked. Uh, you know, you gotta train these kids tough. You gotta put them in situations that they can fight themselves out of and, and build themselves up, become a tougher mentally and physically athlete. It's gonna help translate to them on the field when they get into tough situations on the field they need to perform in, such as a fourth quarter game. When you're dead tired and you're on a 15 play drive, are you going to be able to pull that out and perform? Are you going to back up, say, I'm too tired, I can't get it done? So we're trying to put our athletes in those situations to build that mental toughness, that mental capacity, without putting them in a situation where they're going to get hurt or at a risk of injury. And the rep you perform, that goes back to doing things the right way. It's got to be a great rep. It's got to be a consistent rep. Well, when our athletes come in and do their squat warm up, if they're not squatting down to parallel or just below on their squat warm up, it's going to be very hard to expect them to do that when they're doing their regular work. So you always got to have a focus on what you're doing. And, uh, you know, everything has a purpose, and the, how you do your rep is so important. Flexibility, uh, 
often overlooked. We do the best we can with the time and space we have to get our athletes covered, and I'll talk a little bit more of that later. And then rest and recovery, you know, that goes hand in hand with the life choices and decisions that you make. But it all factors into you having the most development or not so much. Control the controllables. Now, programming considerations. Uh, I've learned a lot about this, being that I've worked in some smaller settings. When I first got to JU, we were seriously lacking in equipment. This top right weight room is the weight room at JU when I walked in the door, and that might actually have been a year or two afterwards. So we had four double racks, 16 platforms, which is really cool, but we only had 16 bumper plates total. So I got eight platforms and I can't load my bars up to do effective training with my teams. So I have to find different ways to get around that. With our new weight room, we have a lot more setup, a lot more opportunity. And then I also included a really large football weight room at an FBS level where you have no shortage of space, equipment, and options. Okay, but whatever your situation is, you have to find out how you can make it successful. You're gonna to have to deal with athlete differences, coaches differences, space, time, equipment, all that stuff plays a factor. The athletes you get are going to be quite a spread of athletes. I included one of, the, I think, the, the smallest athlete we've had in my career here, Katie, who was a very, very great cross-country athlete. And I included an offensive lineman, Kevin Battle. So Katie was four foot seven. I think she might have been around 85 pounds. Kevin Battle was six foot five, 345. One of the strongest kids I've ever worked with. One of the best kids I've ever worked with from an overall perspective. And then Dave Bell, who we just got transferred in. 6'10", 215, which I'd like to get him about 20 more pounds before we start the season. That's going to be quite a struggle. That goes back to our nutrition issue. He thinks that he's eating a lot. We have to show him how to eat a lot, and we have to stay on him about that. So you have to be ready to adjust your programs based off your athletes. And, based off, um, and, and also, you want to get to know your athletes. You want to figure out what their life goals are, what their career goals are, how their academics are going. The more you can get involved with their day-to-day, the easier it's going to be to motivate them when the time comes, you know, to, to get after them a little bit. Um, and then stay on top of those phases of development. The coaches uh, often become one of your biggest problems when you get into a setting in the collegiate athletics. Every coach has their own background, their own philosophy. They all do things a little bit differently. So you have to find out what they're expecting. Know their background. Know their philosophy. Try to mimic their style and the way that you program and the way that you work or find out if they want you to be the opposite. Maybe they want you to be the bad guy and they want to be the good or vice versa. You never really know unless you ask and find out. And then you're going to get some suggestions that your coaches tell you to do and you're going to know from everything you've learned that this is the wrong thing to do. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But then you got to find a way to work that into your program to make your coach feel like his input is really, you know, it's there and it's noticed and you're taking it to heart. Or you got to find ways to tweak it to make it safe or tailor it to be more effective for the particular sport that you're training for. Uh, one uh, uh, example, our lacrosse team had a bye week. And from my perspective, a bye week in season is a great time to help recover, develop, get some really good training in when the competition is far away. It happened to be NFL Combine Week, and he wanted to do an NFL Combine Week for the lacrosse team midseason. To me, that's not the best decision you can make for your, uh, your team moving forward to, to prepare for the next game, but that's what coach wanted to do. So we found a way to work some tests into our weekly to give them kind of the combine experience, but still keep them on track to perform and develop. Um, be prepared for debate. And be prepared to explain what you're doing. And also, if you do have an issue with something they're trying to do, you better have solutions prepared before you go see them. Because they don't want to know about the problem. They want to know how you're going to fix the problem or what your suggestions might be. And they might not entertain your thoughts whatsoever. And sometimes you got to suck it up and do what your coach wants you to do. Uh, time management, scheduling space issues. We have a lot of this with JU. Uh, our classes are limited uh, times that they're offered. So many of our teams want the same space. Now that we've upgraded our weight room, we're able to accommodate more athletes at one time. We could do a split room. We've had up to three teams now training at once based off numbers. I'm just glad that we're able to do that now because before you had to maybe go to the field, you had to do an all manual resistance workout or all band workouts because another team had the weight room secured or change your training altogether. Um, you have to understand practice schedules. How are you going to program and schedule your teams according to practice schedules? 
how many days you're going to be in the weight room, how many days will you be on the field, uh, is there enough space and equipment to do the exercise that you want. When I got to JU, having only 16 bumper plates, I'm not going to get very much Olympic weightlifting done. And we didn't do many Olympic weightlifts for the first three years I worked there until we were able to bring in some more equipment, and then we took the time to put those movements in. Uh, so programming now, designing a warm-up. What are the reasons you go through your warm-up? Increase your core temperature. Bring fresh blood and oxygen coming through all your major muscles and joints. So you want to increase the blood flow and oxygen supply. You want to stimulate the central nervous system. And you want it to be geared towards the type of activity you're going to do. This is going to help improve your motor control, your coordination. You want to do some movement preparation. So if it's going to be a lower body lift, you're going to want to get your legs moving through many ranges of motion throughout your lower body to help activate and prepare all those joints for the strenuous activity that's about to come. And while you're doing this all, you can increase your range of motion and mobility. We do a lot of our mobility work as part of our warm up. It's a way not only to get it in, but it's also a way to help actively increase their temperature just the same. Um, and then the other thing too that could often be overlooked a lot of time is that warm up time is a way to help your athlete mentally prepare or focus in for what's about to happen because you know, we train very hard. And you can't come in passive. You have to be focused in and ready to go. Sometimes it might take a good two or three minutes in a warm-up to get, uh, get your athletes focused and ready. And you also have to consider what's going on in the workout. This is the warm-up sheet that I send out with my packets. This is our on-field dynamic warm-up. Uh, I usually do some sort of a dynamic stretch or sometimes I'll static stretch mid-warm-up. But... When I do that, I always make sure that I save some of our higher level dynamic warm up movements to be coming after that to reactivate all of our muscles and get ready to develop the force that's about to happen, uh, you know, whether we're training, whether we're going to practice. And then when I'm designing weight room warm ups, I'm thinking about core temperature, I'm thinking about upper body, and I'm thinking about lower body. And I got to figure out, you know, what, uh, what's going to be in the workout. So on the side here, I got some total body programming here. This is a weight room warm up that I would use upper body only, and a lot of times I will still throw in some lower body warm-up movements because I'm often we're trying to recover from a previous workout just the same as get another workout going. So if I can throw any warm-up protocols in that's going to help out with recovery from a previous lift, I'm always going to try to get that done. Speed, agility, and conditioning program. I'm not going to touch on the specifics of how I put all this together, but I just want to talk about you know, the things I think about when I'm considering it. So what's your athlete's conditioning level? Because I work with many different sports that are in season, off season at many different times. It's not just one, it would be really nice to have just one, but it's not right now. So I have to find out what level are they in? Did I give them a program to take home? Uh, did they do the program, which Coach Milo was talking about a lot. And that happens often to our athletes. What's the emphasis of the training uh, for football for me? Are we doing spring football early? Because we're in the South now, we could do it real early. Are we gonna do it late? How fast do I have to have my athletes prepared for the rigors of practice? Do I have at any time? Or what's the coach's emphasis? Does he want me to get them as big and strong as possible right now because we're a small football team? Or does he want me to have them in great physical shape and running two days a week? We ended up going one day a week running for this first five weeks of our offseason this year to, to help get our guys a little bit bigger and stronger. Uh, How is it going to relate to your lift and practice schedule? Because even though you're offseason, Every sport usually has an off-season training time that's near game or near in-season level. So how can you still get speed, agility work in while your athletes are still performing their sport on the field? And then you also have to understand how to progress. We usually progress our agilities with either reps. We could count distance per agility. Uh, and I'll tell you that normally the plan that's laid out changes throughout the workout based on how the kids respond. I'm ready to adjust an agility day at a moment's notice based off, maybe we're not hitting the lines, we gotta keep repeating drills. Maybe we're not getting around cones, so we gotta keep repeating drills. Maybe they're in a lot worse shape than I thought they were in at the first time. So you always have to keep an eye out and, and evaluate what's going on around you to make adjustments in your program. Uh, I do like to make sure that our effort is perfect and our reps are perfect. If I have a kid that pulls up on a sprint through a finish, the whole group's gonna go back, we're all gonna run it again because you can't get that rep back in a game. We're gonna make sure that every rep that we do is 100% effort all this thing, every time. That's gonna to have to be the standard. You can't not go 100% while you train 
and expect to be 100% on game day. And I've heard it from everybody, all these kids, kids that come through. Oh, I'll be all right on game day. I'll be all right on game day. Well, it's not about game day. It's about every day leading up to that game day. Have you prepared yourself to be a champion every single time you step on the field? And that really, really matters. I like to keep our drills very simple to start. And sometimes, depending how well they take to them or how big your group is, you can get a little more complex. But I like to keep it simple so I can keep my effort level very, very intense and make sure they're going to get the work done. If I have 50 guys in a run group and I have a complex agility drill and we get two reps done because they can't understand it, is that better than me doing a simple drill for 10 to 12 reps of really, really great effort? I think I would rather take my 10 to 12 reps and get them some really good work instead of go really complex. And although it looks really cool, and we did some spins around the cones and the somersaults and whatever, you could do all that stuff too. But look at what you're getting done and look at what you're not getting done. It's very important. And if you got time, make sure you can stretch, cool down after all your runs. Obviously, if you're going to go lift right away after your run day, you might want to save that for the end. Uh, we do utilize the limitifs in our weight room. Uh, most of our teams do this. Uh, we pull from the floor. We pull from the hang positions. We'll snatch. We'll push jerk. I just put some clips. All the pictures I threw in this uh, presentation all came from this week. So these are all pictures that happen in, in, real, real close to this date right now. Um, but you got to understand the purpose of what you're trying to get out of this. Because when I got in at JU, we had a coach that did a whole lot of Olympic weightlifting, but not a lot of uh, brains or context to the planning phase. One of the workouts I heard the guys tell me about was, how many cleans can you do in one hour? I mean, at, think about what that is. Okay? And we had about 30 surgeries on our football team when I got here. Just the football team. So imagine a 30-year football team is out with surgeries in one calendar year. And that's all based on not understanding what you're trying to get out of your training. So we didn't do any Olympic weightlifting my first two or three years of our football team, but we still found ways to improve everybody's explosive power development. All their testing went up. We had great results. We won a lot of games. It's all because we just had to tailor according to what our situation was. And it was hard the first year to sell the guys on not doing power cleans. But then all of a sudden the tests came in, all their verts went up, all their broads went up, all their times improved. And they were happy about it. And then as we went further along, we got to add some more of that stuff. And as we go, and now we use a full lineup of Olympic weightlifting. Um, we always pair our Olympic weightlifts up with my sports, uh, with a plyometric movement or some type of loaded jump. I got a rocket jump right here. This is Dave Bell doing a rocket jump off a bench with a 45 pound plate. Uh, another one of our basketball guys, Tanner, he's going to do a single leg rocket jump, an unweighted jump off one leg. And then I got a former player of mine that's going to be playing in Canada this year doing a lateral broad jump with a rotation of 90 degrees, trying to get some multi-directional plyos in the mix too. Throughout the week, I'm trying to look at what's my available days to train? How can I hit as many parameters of explosive power as relating to direction, single leg, double leg? Uh, is it going to be more of a hip dominant movement? Is it going to be more of an ankle dominant movement? How can I round out as many ways as I can of that explosive athleticism throughout the week? And I'm going to try to program for that. And obviously, you'll have to make changes as you go. And, and I kind of I have a good idea of the difficulty of all the exercises I select. So I understand that I might start, say, basketball postseason. We did a body weight rocket jump to start with a huge emphasis on the landing and a huge emphasis on the full extension of the hips, knees, and ankles. First couple weeks in, we're going to go and then we progress that the following week to add a 25 pound. Next week, added a 45 pound. We're going to do one more week on the 45 pound. When we come back with the freshman, we're going to start body weight again or potentially a single leg, depending on what level those guys come in at. I have no idea what my freshman will look like right now. Uh, when they walk in the doors, when I'll figure that out. Okay, but you're always trying to hit it as many different ways as you can throughout the week. We also program in upper body plyometrics. I, I don't think we do it as often. And it's also per sport. For football, I have more in there than my women's lacrosse team. Okay? They're going to be doing a little bit more pushing down and pushing and grabbing and pulling, and they got to be able to generate force quickly in that regard. So we'll pair these up, usually within our major upper body blocks, or we still sometimes will throw these into our Olympic blocks. But we'll use different variations. Uh, could be band push-up jump is what we have right here, a med ball drop. Could be as simple as throwing a band around your back doing a different type of punch series. You could even do a band on a machine 
So you've got to use your whole body support as a structure to push against. But as many times and as many ways as we can hit this throughout the week based off our training cycle, we're going to get that done. We also do a lot of balance, body control, proprioception stuff. This is a step ladder hurdle drill where the athlete will jump and stick, laterally jump and stick, forward jump and stick. Every single time they land, we're trying to get them to absorb the landing, not double hop, be in control of their body, you know, feel real good about where they are. They're not going fast. When they go too fast, that's because it's easier to go fast. If you're using that spring and hopping in your jumps, I want them to be able to control themselves and stick. We're getting the explosive power already. Now I want them to be able to control their body throughout many different planes. And we'll also throw rotational hops in here. Uh, I do a lot more of this stuff with basketball, and partially it's because I have less numbers, and it's partially because of what they do on the court and how their sport relates to it but every athlete that we have can benefit from this. This is one of the things I noticed from our freshmen coming in, is I get some really strong freshmen that come in, but they cannot control their body whatsoever. And we also get a lot of help with this during our traditional uh, strength training, like a dumbbell lunge walk, for instance, which we'll talk about later, it's gonna help them control their body through a multitude of ranges of motions. Upper body programming, I usually, uh, when I'm programming upper body, lower body, I'm thinking about presses and pulls, and I'm trying to hit angles. Okay, so we have a shoulder press, dumbbell, we have a cable pull down, and I have a shoulder exercise that we call a chain T. It's going to be a front raise to a spread, trying to affect a lot of muscles in the shoulders there. For upper body presses, so we're going to go flat, incline, either overhead, a, a vertical shoulder press, military press, and we're going to try to hit these angles throughout the week. I'm, if I only have two days to train, it might be a flat bench and an incline bench. If I got three days to train or if I have two days dedicated upper body only, it could be a horizontal day with a, with a vertical overhead component and the other day would be a, an incline angle. Uh, I don't spend much time on decline presses. We might do some dip competitions occasionally, but we pretty much, I feel like we could round out most of what we need to get rounded out with the selections that we have already. We also do different variations. Obviously, double arm barbell presses, single arm, alternating. Down here is a tic-tac-toe press. So they're going to lift the weight up, hit a right, hit a left, hit a double. That's just another way that we can affect their muscles a little bit differently, affect their whole body a little bit differently, because you never know what they're going to have to use on game day to have success. We're trying to cover all those throughout the week. Upper body pulls, same type of concept. You know, we're looking at angles. Pulling down, pulling down, pulling in, pulling up. We're going to try to round those over here uh, with all different variations throughout the week. I got a dumbbell row, incline row, and a pullover. We had a pull down the first page. We also do a lot of pull-ups. Now, we're doing all these things, but the emphasis is still always going to be on technique because you could do bad pulls, you could do bad presses, you could do partial reps. We're always training through a full range of motion no matter what the exercise is unless there's a physical limitation that I know from the training room. Sometimes I discover those limitations and I bring them to the training room just based off what we do day to day in the weight room. Shoulders, when I'm programming for my shoulders in my workouts, I'm thinking of the anterior delt, lateral delt, posterior delt, traps and all the scap and rotator cuff muscles. And I'm trying to find how I can affect all of those muscles throughout my given training week. And I'll have some examples uh, soon of the full week and how we spread that out. But we got a plate front raise here. Got an upright row, close pit internal external. We'll do multiple angles of internal external throughout the week, trying to cover as much musculature as possible. We do a lot of manual resistance stuff. This is a manual resistance rear delt fly here, and then also a scap shrug down, because you can never do enough scap work. It often it gets neglect. People are just shrugging all day. Now we still do our fair share of shrugs, but we want to shrug in multiple different angles throughout the week to cover all that muscle. Lower body programming. Uh, this is a lateral step up here. I also talk about lower body pulls. That would, to me would be a lot of your posterior chain work and then our hips, really mostly related to abduction, adduction, and hip flexor work. I got some videos here. Uh, this is a squat that we had this week from one of our stronger offensive linemen. Uh, let's see if I can get this to play. This is a 555 pound squat for six reps. If his depth wasn't perfect, this video would not have made it on here. And if his depth wasn't perfect, I'd immediately cut him down in his weight because it's too heavy. 
you got to understand the translation of performance. And with a guy this strong, I have many conversations with him about the fact that if you put your bench from, or sorry, your squat from 650 to 675, what's the risk going to be in the weight room lifting versus the reward on the field? And I don't think that the reward on the field is going to be as great as sometimes the risk is to be in the weight room of getting this kid hurt. They're not going to notice that 25 pound different. I don't think he's plenty strong enough already. So with him, I talk about how can we get you to move better? Cause he's, you'll see, he's kind of got a round shape. He still bends very well, but he doesn't move as good as he potentially could. I'll say it flip. I'm not sure how normal that's going to look, but we'll try it. So we got a spotter right with him the whole time, uh, following along. You can see he's hitting parallel or just below. He's still got his upright posture. He's got a lot of weight on that bar. Uh, we often will have spotters on the edge of the barbell also to make sure that he's in a safe spot. You know, and, and you got to monitor those guys. He's a guy that's going to work hard. And he's going to push the weight. So I got to make sure that I keep an eye on him to keep him safe. This is another, this is a running back of ours, uh, Jamal Ajima. He did a barbell lunge, 315 for six each leg with zero false steps. He's 195 pounds. It might have been one of the most impressive lunges I've seen. And that video also doesn't look like it's working. And then the final one, dumbbell lunge walk is a huge thing that we do at JU. And let me pause it for a minute. This is an exercise that I like to consider a can't hide exercise. We have specific rules on our lunge walk. So you're getting your knee on the ground every time, no matter what. You cannot take a false step. If you step in the middle, that's a false step. If you're lunging and you get off balance, that's a false step. If you step short, you could try to lunge it where you're at. But if you reset your foot, it then becomes a false step. And although you might not always be in the best a physiological position during that lunge, it's a toughness thing. You got to find a way to get it done because you're not going to be in the best position all throughout your sport competition. So you have to find a way to get it done. And also we go up every set on our lunges. So if you complete a set at 75, we got four sets. You got to go up every single time. Now, Andy Jones is a wide receiver for the lions. Uh, he's one of my only NFL athletes. This is 122 pound dumbbells with six 20 pound chains around his neck for 10 yards. He's about 220 pounds right there with about 365. No false steps. And even more impressive is he came back three hours after his lift because he failed this set during his lift and he was so mad about it that he came back later in the day, warmed up again, and he made an effort to, to make it happen. It's tremendous, uh, tremendous. So as far as lower body presses go, we're going to squat. We're going to front squat. We're going to back squat. We're going to goblet squat. We're going to do step ups, lateral forward. We're going to lunge, lateral forward. We'll do combinations. We'll hit a step up lunge at some point of the year. We'll do different individual TRX, single leg squats, single leg squats to benches. However many ways I can hit the musculature, the lower body, single leg and double leg throughout the week, I'm going to do that. Lower body pulls are always going to be paired up with our presses. Throughout the week, I'm going to try to get a hip dominant pull, which to me would be like an RDL or a single leg RDL, bang a morning. Or we're going to get a knee dominant, like we got a physio ball leg curl here, machine leg curl, slide board, hamstring curls. Really, your equipment is going to dictate a lot about what you do there. So that's going to be a huge determinant. But throughout the week, we're going to try to hit those muscles in as many different ways as we can, whether it's single, double, knee, hip, hip. And I'll show you guys the spread of the week to kind of show how I spread out those particular exercises. And then we also have our hips. We throw this in the mix. This is one of the most overlooked things that I see with my athletes coming out of high schools is they all bench squat and clean. They bench squat and clean. Same with dumbbell lunge walks. That's something that kills guys that come out of high school too that have never done it before. I've seen a really strong 600 pound squatter coming into his freshman year of college 
And I seen him come to tears because he couldn't lunge walk 25 pounds for 25 yards. And it's crazy to me because you wouldn't assume that that would happen, but that's what happens. And it's because a lot of the little structural support muscles are underdeveloped in those kids. So this is a way that we can affect a lot of those muscles of the hips that tend to get overlooked in a, in a general program. We're always going to hit a bent leg inner outer per week. So we have our band partner manual inner outer. You can do that with just bands only. You can even do some of these on air. Like our straight leg inner router, which would be right here. This is one that you can do on air. 15 or 20 reps, slow and controlled, you're going to burn your hip up. And you're going to affect all those muscles a little bit further than you wouldn't normally affect in your traditional squat. And then we're going to also hit the inner just the same. And then I got a standing hip flexor march with the TRX that I like to use with a really good pause. It's more of body control, positional stuff. And then we also have band hip flexor, and we'll do manual resistance hip flexor too. The hip flexor training might take a little bit of a back burner when we have a lot of speed and agility training going on, but otherwise I'm going to try to get that done week to week. Uh, for core training, you know, I consider our core to be up here around the neck and all the way down to just under the hips because you can utilize all that stuff throughout your training. Uh, we actually just got slide boards added to our uh, arsenal a few weeks ago. This is one of our basketball guys doing a rotational wiper on the slide board. I also have some med ball partner work from some of my female lacrosse athletes, but could also double as an upper body plyometric too while you get your core done. So this is com combining two different things together to get similar results. When I program for my core, I'm thinking of upper middle, lower middle, side, side, and back, and how can I round that out throughout each day? I'm going to try to pick a spread of exercises where I can affect all those areas throughout the week. And I'm going to try to hit them in a little bit different ways throughout the course of the semester or course of the training cycle. Uh, you can always pick uh, different progressions uh, with difficulty by varying reps, varying time. We might keep it the same for two or three weeks and add reps and add time to the same type of thing. Because I also want them to get really good at what they're doing so they can give me all their effort every single time. Don't overthink your core training. Now, we also do neck training. And I do this football. And women's lacrosse teams, definitely, I may start with men's basketball this year, but we haven't had many issues. I've actually had almost as many concussions on women's lacrosse as I've had football. It's, it's pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's wild. A lot of it's unrelated to the sport, too. So we're just trying to protect them for daily life, I guess, because it could be falling in the bathroom. But one girl opened a cabinet and hit herself in the head. You know, I can't control that, but can I help prevent it? I'm going to try to. We do manual resistance neck. We don't have any neck machines. So we'll go front neck, which is up on the top, back neck, side to side. We'll even go face neck with a rotational push here. And throughout the week, I'm going to try to get all that done throughout the week as long as I have enough opportunity for that. These are two of our seniors from last year. I tried to find some pretty good looking necks. Uh, we call it dolphin neck. If you've ever seen the neck on a dolphin before, it's really big. It's there. It's really big. So that's what we try to we try to create that dolphin neck for our football athletes, you know, so they're protected. And then grip and forearm training. Grip is huge. We spend a lot of time on grip, uh, mainly towards the end of our lifts, because I want their grip to be fresh for some of the major lifting that we're doing. But then as the workout's getting to its tail end, we're going to go ahead and try to fatigue those uh, muscles a little bit more. We're going to use a lot of different protocols for that. We've got wrist rollers here. Grip. Uh, this is a spring clip from Home Depot. We would do different types of grip exercises with spring clips, plate flips, rice buckets. We ordered grip force handles this year to wrap around our dumbbells and barbells. And as simple as a PVC pipe, doing rotational work against a partner from all different angles, you can always mix up your grip work. And also the addition of a towel to many, many movements helps out. We might put a towel through some plates, have them do a towel farmer's carry or towel pull-ups or towel hangs. And then just the same, we're focused on the calf and ankle. We'll do ankles through band ankle work. We got six-way band ankle we like to do. We'll go three-way calf raise. We'll do weighted, uh, unweighted. We'll do partner where your partner actually gets on your back and weights you up as a donkey calf raise. That's more summer football time. And we also do a manual ankle. And we'll pair that up oftentimes with the heel walk or a toe walk just to further affect those muscles. Now, flexibility and recovery. We try to do this as much as we can, but in our setting at JU, we have 19 sports that use a 2,200 square foot weight room. So oftentimes, we have a team at the door waiting to start their warm up as I'm barely getting all my stuff done for my teams. With our upgrade in our room, I was able to take our old floor and actually lay it 
out back behind our weight room outside. So we added about 2,000 square feet to the outside area of our weight room so we can kind of flow teams out to finish their stretch or cool down or their last little bit of bi tri grip. Or we could bring a team out there to start their warm up while I finish up on the main floor to get our other teams out. So it's kind of like an assembly line almost of development. And, and that's when we go about, you know, I was going to have the time and space and equipment that you want. You've got to find ways to get what you need to get done. And that's how we'd like to do it. We'll use foam rollers. We'll use band stretching. We'll use just regular static stretching. We'll use partner stretching. Uh, we try to get a variety. Have a plan in your brain all the time. Have a stretch routine always lined up that you never forget because you might be out at practice and you might get a green light from coach to stretch the team for 15 minutes. You can't be thinking about what you're going to do. You already got to know what you're going to do. Or if you only have six minutes, you got to understand, I have six minutes to get the most effective stretch done that I can get done. What are going to be my choices? And you should have that predetermined in your brain, uh, essentially, with what you want to get done. We try to get it done every day. And we also, this is all lower body, but we do upper body stretch on most of our upper body lifts, just the same, to help jumpstart our recovery process a little bit. Uh, In-season goals, obviously we want to win. So we're going to do all we can do in season to help our athletes win. We want to limit our injuries. That doesn't really change. But we want to keep our players fresh for practice and games. I've had coaches tell me that they're my legs during the season. Well, coach, they're our legs during the season. Okay, we're all trying to win together here. So help me help you out. We need to communicate a little bit more. But, uh, but some coaches can get kind of upset. Uh, I've had an issue before with our dumbbell lunge walk week messing with a men's lacrosse off-season training plan. So we had to adjust our days because they couldn't run for two, sometimes three days after our lunge walk day. So we had to change our day so they could actually get some quality practices in. Because although I want to train them, I want to get them as big and strong as I can. If I'm affecting their skill development in their sport, then am I really doing them a, a good service? Am I really helping them be the best that they can be? You want to keep them mentally and physically strong. Okay, talk to them, find out what's going on, communicate with your athletes. I like to find a good couple that I can trust so I can get an honest feedback from them. And then um, you also have to have a developmental program for your low minute, low rep, red shirt type athletes. And they're going to come asking for those anyway. So don't be caught you know, with your hands in your pockets not knowing what to do. They're going to come in and they want to get some extra work. And some of them that don't want to get that extra work, you have to help them get the extra work because they don't understand the opportunity that they might have as a redshirt athlete to improve upon themselves. Off-season goals are a little bit different, um, you know, but not that much different. We're, we're going to try to improve athletic ability. We're going to try to develop their strength and power, multi-directional strength and power. If they have a body fat issue or they're trying to get a percentage down or they're trying to make a weight gain, it's a good time to focus on that. It's going to take constant counseling for that. Uh, improve mental physical toughness definitely and help assist in recovery protocols uh, now we don't have scheduled recovery stuff but at some other schools I know they scheduled that in for their whole team to come in and do that type of stuff we don't have the ability to do that here so I have to counsel our kids constantly on the importance of that and tell them we're open the weight rooms here we have everything you need just come do it like they said earlier what I was gonna say in mine is it's 50 50 you've heard that already a couple times I tell our incoming kids, I can give you the best program that I can put together, but if you don't meet me halfway and give me your all every single day, it's not going to work for you like you want it to. And also, during this time, you're going to develop good habits, good work habits, good camaraderie, and build your team up. As far as picking what I'm doing during the season, you might have two to four days of weight training, depending on your team, depending on your sport. I'm roughly going to do 20 to 30 set workouts. I usually have about an hour to get going uh, and to get everything done. I start higher to low rep. I do more of a linear periodization model. I'll start around the 12 to 15 range. I'll work down throughout the weeks, and then I'll come back up. For instance, our summer program goes 12, 10, 8, 6, 12, 10, 8, 6, 10, 8, 6, 4, which leads us into our camp. And then I'll try to get maybe an 8 or 10 rep range early on in camp, and I'll bring them down to like a heavy 3 to 5 or a 2 to 4 by the time we hit our first game. And then based off our season, I'll change my rep schemes based off the level of competition that we play. So if we have a bye week coming up, I'm going to try to get us back up in that six to eight rep range, try to get a few more really good reps in while we have the chance, and then work back down to our lower, lower, uh, lower numbers, higher intensity, lower volume type lifts at our real, real critical moments. And I have a really good success rate with my freshmen coming in, hitting uh, most of them will hit their best bench and squat before the end of their first semester here. 
and it's all just working consistently, trying to eat right and take care of your body. Um, training loads are going to be high during the season. They're going to be high during the off season, but they're always based according to the reps. You've got to understand what kind of reps you're looking for. I used to like to work off rep ranges. I like to work off suggestions so guys can make adjustments in their training based off how they're feeling day to day. This is the off season week. This is week three for football this year. So on here, you can see uh, we have an Olympic lift. Now power clean is not usually something that I would bring out this quickly in the off season, but our numbers are down tremendously right now. We have about 55 athletes on our football team and I have a really good grasp on all of them. So there's not that much teaching going on. They've been doing this for a while. So we started off with that. Okay, we have a plyometric box jump with a depth jump here and a lateral broad jump. So we got two areas there. I'm gonna pair our core up with our power clean because we're limited on space. So they can hit a clean, hit a jump, hit a jump, hit a core. It's gonna give us plenty of opportunity to utilize our entire room and not have guys standing around and waiting because you gotta be efficient. You don't have much time. You gotta make the best uh, work of your time. And then we're gonna do a double leg front squat, single leg RDL, a straight leg banded inner outer, and then a hip hike, which would just be a movement right here. It's really a core lift. And then we're going to hit our neck. We got front and back neck, it looks like here. For our upper body day, dumbbell incline, incline angle, open pit internal, external, push up jump, upper body plyometric. We got a pull down. We'll use different grips on our pull down, a towel upright row to get some shoulder work going on. And this looks like pizza pies, which is also another shoulder exercise. We'll hit core stations at the end, and then two grip stations. Wednesday would be our run day. We lifted legs Monday. Tuesday, we got upper body. We gave them enough chance to be recovered here for our Wednesday team run. I always run us in a team because when we have multiple run groups, I might have a really good one. I might have an okay one. I might have a really bad one. So then a third of my team thinks, oh, yeah, we're doing great. Everyone's on the same page. But they don't understand that more than half their team might have had a terrible day. So we try to get them around for team runs as much as we can. And this is what I was talking about for agilities. I planned on doing three cone each way, triangle each way, and then maybe a couple 60-yard shuttles. We only got three reps that day of to the right. Three reps, three cone to the right, because there were so many guys making mistakes. Some lines had to repeat 10 times in a row. It all could have been a line touch, could have been getting around a cone. It could have been one of your coaches just trying to call someone out to be a jerk because that happens too. But whatever it was, that's what happened that first day. So I had to be ready to adjust. If I tried to run that whole thing, there would have been some guys in some trouble. So then we look at our next day. We've hit the other end of it. We got a hang position, Olympic lift. We have a hurdle hop with a stick landing for body control and a split jump. We'll walking lunge. That's our single leg press. We got a double leg pull with the legs here. We're going to hit our hamstring curl to get a knee dominant, a bent leg inner outer, and a manual hip flexor. So we've rounded out the lower body, in my opinion, throughout the week right there, including our run day. And then our upper body lift will also complement that upper body lift we had here just the same. And then in season, a little different. We have uh, upper body lift on Sundays. We always lift upper body and run. Now, everybody does this, but based off your minutes, your playing time, how many snaps you got, you can base your effort level. We don't time the sprints that we run. If you're a guy that didn't play a lot, I'm expecting you to run your ass off and I'm gonna be calling you out about it the whole time. If you're a guy that played a lot, I definitely let you know that you need to chill a little bit. You can stride them. If you gotta go a little slower, great. And if you were banged up, we'll also have a core section going on during that time. And then we'll come in and get a heavy upper body lift that day. And that could be modified accordingly. It's always suggested weights in season because guys get banged up day to day. You got to make adjustments. And then we have heavy leg day, all of our lower body, all of our upper body Thursday, lower body Tuesday, and Friday we have a developmental workout that'll kind of complement the whole week. Women's lacrosse, a little bit different. I got two weeks, so they're off season here. You'll see these are two total body days. But if you look at the exercise selection, it's the same type of deal. Split squat, back squat. Straight leg inner outer, bent leg inner outer. Good morning. Physio ball curl. So we're hitting all that. Hip lifts, single leg box hip lifts, barbell incline, open pit. Dumbbell bench, closed pit. We're trying to complement each other throughout the week to cover as many different angles of pulls and presses as we could get done. And this is in season. But one more thing too, our lacrosse coaches love circuit training. So I put together circuits over here 
upper, lower, and total body to make sure that they are getting what they need to get. Charting, I'm going to go kind of quick here. Charting, this is a chart I use for, or, sorry, a workout card. I've used this my first year at women's lacrosse here at JU, but since then, I have switched to charting. I love charting a lot better. For me, I can see day-to-day -day what you're doing. This is a back squat chart from this past week. So guys fill out their reps and sets every week for me. I get it entered in the computer so I can see on a daily basis who's doing what. If I notice a problem, I could pull the athlete aside and talk to him right away about what's going on. Why didn't you hit this number? Are you hurt? Did you get hurt? Do you not want to see the trainer? You know, we got to figure out why, because ultimately you're here to develop and get better. Um, so these are a really good way for me to check that out. And we don't monitor everything, but we do our major lifts and many of our multi-joint lifts. Uh, injury modifications, if you're hurt in our weight room, you're always going to train. If you have an ankle sprain, we're going to hit that as many ways as we can. For instance, if you have an ankle sprain, dumbbell step-ups is our exercise. I might take it to a machine leg curl, get the quad, a machine leg extension, get the hamstring, and then a four-way hip behind the leg to get the glute or maybe a shuttle kickback. And then I might have you come out and do a low box step-up if you can tolerate that, maybe a full box step-up body weight to get you in that movement still while we already pre-fatigued your muscles a little bit. Same with upper body. You're going to have to find a lot of ways to program around injuries, but understand what you're trying to get done in your major lift and how can you tailor your modifications to hit all those muscles. Testing and evaluation. This is the last thing I'm going to cover. Uh, why are you testing? Usually it's for performance evaluation, it's for program evaluation, or it's for progress tracking. And those are all great reasons to test, and you should definitely test. So you should know what your program is doing and how you can make adjustments throughout it also helps motivate your athletes to see their progress and see their development. Uh, I've been testing a little bit less lately as we've gone on because I'm spending more of my time doing what I think is important as training instead of testing. And some of my coaches feel the same way. I haven't tested women's lacrosse in, in much of our lifts. Now, what I have here is the highlighted things are the things that I test kind of across the board with my teams that I have been pretty consistent with. The other ones I've tested, if they got a C next to them, those are stuff my coach, the coach tests. The staff takes care of that stuff. So for football, we're always going to do our vert, broad. We're going to back squat. We're going to bench press. Now we power clean. We're going to body fat once or twice a year. Usually that's more of a high needs basis. And then obviously the NFL combine drills is what our coaches like me to test us on. And we have a record board that they like to fill out. Uh, so we try to get that done. We have a record board, though, and I make sure that you don't get on the record board unless your reps are perfect. So understand that you're going to get on the record board eventually, but if you don't build it up the right way, it's not going to happen for you. You're not going to get the results you want. Uh, I don't really test much on basketball any longer because he wants me to just focus on getting him prepared. And if you're charting your athletes week to week and you're fully involved in what they're doing, you'll see their progress and see their development. You don't necessarily need a test to show you that if you've already tested your programming and you kind of have an idea it works. But I'm not saying don't test. I would love to do more testing. I just don't have the availability of time always to make it as the most effective thing for me. You've got to pick and choose what your battles are. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank all my influences in my career. Thanks to Dr. Hooper uh, and my staff at JU. I couldn't do all we do here without them. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me?